The Super Bowl was this past Sunday. And a big part of the Super Bowl are the commercials. People pay a lot of money to get a Super Bowl, to get a commercial during the Super Bowl. In fact, people are still talking about those commercials. But have you ever seen bad advertising? The whole point of advertising is to attract people to the product and to even get them excited about using the product. But sometimes advertising has the opposite effect. Let me show you a couple examples. This is a miracle drug right here. But yet, if you notice where the green arrow is, it says simulated imagery. Now, I don't smoke, but if I ever were, this would be the brand because it's recommended by my dentist. I have no idea what this ad is even for, but if you notice, it says visit our newly renovated funeral home and best ribs in town. <laughs> All in the same ad, and only for $99. It's a deal, I think. I just saw this one this week. If you need to get your eyes checked, this is the place to go, because with every eye test, you get a free rectal photography? Now here's 7up bragging about having the youngest customers in the business. I don't know about you, but seeing that baby drinking 7 Up kind of makes me thirsty. Uh, but probably not the best advertisement in the world. And finally, 24-hour animal control. They remove the nuisance of wild animals, and by looking at the pictures, they get rid of raccoons, bats, skunks, and babies. I'm not sure what the baby has to do with that, but that's advertising. Maybe it was a restaurant you went to that promised to have the world's best coffee. But you tried that coffee, and it was not very really good. It may have, in fact, been the world's worst coffee. It made your stomach upset. Nothing was good about that coffee. Or it was that gas station you stopped at that promised clean restaurant. But it was anything but clean. In fact, it almost looked like the person who just had the world's worst cup of coffee had been in there before you. <laughs> when you see bad or misleading advertising, where the product just doesn't live up to the hype, it can turn you off to what it represents. The problem is that followers of Jesus are supposed to represent Jesus. But too often, what we are is bad advertising. The church, likewise, is supposed to represent Christ. But too often, we actually are bad advertising. Maybe you've heard about the book called Unchristian. It's a book where a research group interviewed thousands of non-believing young adults, asking them to share their impression, impressions of Christians. The answers weren't pretty. They viewed churchgoers as being judgmental, hypocritical. The book is called Unchristian because they asked the young adults how they would describe people who follow Jesus. And they said they were unchristian. They were turned off from Jesus by the very people who were supposed to represent Jesus. And young adults aren't the only people that have said this. Gandhi once said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And the famous atheist Friedrich Nietzsche was asked why he was so negative to Christians. He said, I would believe in their salvation if they looked a little more like people who had been saved. Today, as we continue our series, God for the Rest of Us, 
I want us to think about people who have been turned off by church. And I want you to know that God is for those people who have been turned off by church. Today we're going to look at one of Jesus' most famous sermons, the Sermon on the Mount. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help this church to not be bad advertising. Help this church to be good advertising for you. And we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to be with us, Lord. In your Son's name. Amen. So let's begin the Sermon on the Mount. We first start looking at Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, where it says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. What's Jesus saying here? He's saying that we're the advertiser, right? As followers of Jesus, you are salt and you are light. So what does salt do? It makes food taste better, but it also makes you thirsty. Alternate route number two. Both have that. So Christians are supposed to make the world taste better, but also to make people thirsty for Jesus. So what does light do? It shines. It illuminates the darkness. So Christians are supposed to shine God's light and bring joy and hope to this world. You're the advertiser. And what an honor that is. That God would choose us to represent Him. He didn't have to do it that way. But what an honor it is that he did. C.S. Lewis once wrote that God seemed to do nothing of himself which he can possibly delegate to his creatures. He commands us to do slowly and blunderingly what he could do perfectly in an entwinkling of an eye. It's a huge honor, but there is a problem. The problem is when Christians are actually bad advertising. Maybe you've experienced that, and maybe it's turned you off. It could be that you went to that church and someone in leadership there misused their power in some way. Or maybe you went to a church because you were struggling and you needed help, but instead you felt judged. Maybe it was that church that, quite frankly, just bored you. And it was so irrelevant, you figured it was a waste of your time to go back. Or maybe what turned you off was hypocrisy. And if you really think about it, a church leader misusing their power, people being judgmental, church being boring, they're all examples of hypocrisy, of a church not living out what they claim to be. Maybe you've seen lots of examples of this. And maybe, for some of you, this turns you away from church. If so, it may encourage you to know that Jesus was also turned away by the hypocrites. In fact, the idea of this series, that God being so far away and being uninterested, 
is the point that Jesus showed us that he's actually that God is actually full of love, he's full of grace, even for people who screw up, even for sinners, for everyone. Jesus was absolutely, unapologetically patient with people and compassionate with them. But there was one group who Jesus was harsh with. Religious people who were hypocrites. In fact, sometimes we see Jesus going off on these religious hypocrites. We see that in Matthew chapter 23. Woe to you, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Woe to you, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the most important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter while neglecting the former. You blind guys. You strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of a cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, you hypocrites. You are like, white, you are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. If hypocrites turn you off, Jesus felt the exact same way. In fact, hypocrisy seems to be the one thing that Jesus just wouldn't tolerate. Probably in part because he knew how bad at advertising that actually was. When people claim to represent God, but in fact they live a hypocritical lifestyle. That's why it's so critical for Christians to learn to not be hypocritical. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus shares some principles that teaches us how not to be a hypocrite. One principle is to follow the heart of the law and not just the letter of the law. After telling us that we are the salt and the light, Jesus continues by talking about how it said, do not murder. That's the letter of the law. Do not murder. But he goes on to say that I tell you to not even get angry. You think you're special for not murdering someone? But the heart of the law is to love people. Follow the heart of the law and not just the letter of the law. Then Jesus talks about adultery and how it's been said, do not commit adultery. Again, that is the letter of the law. But then he adds, I tell you to not even lust after someone. You think you're special for not committing adultery? But the heart of the law says to treat others as being valuable and to treat them the way you'd like to be treated. Follow the heart of the law and not just the letter of the law. So the problem is, you can follow the letter of the law. And on the outside, you appear to people as being righteous. But on the inside, you can still be filled with wickedness. And so what you really are is a hypocrite. Do you struggle with hypocrisy? Maybe you follow the letter of the law about serving. You know you're supposed to volunteer at church, so you do. 
But you show up as late as possible, and you leave as soon as you can. If that's you, you need to ask God for a right heart. To where you truly want to serve people. Where instead of doing the least that you can, you want to do the most that you can. Maybe you follow the letter of the law in your marriage. You're not supposed to commit adultery, so you don't. But you don't honor your spouse. You don't make time together a priority. If that's you, you'd ask God for a right heart. Or instead of just avoiding romance with someone who's not your spouse, you intentionally kindle romance with your spouse. Maybe you follow the letter, the letter of the law when it comes to giving. You know that you're supposed to give 10% a tithe of your income and offering. And you do so. You do, don't you? But you hate doing it. And you make sure to not even give an extra nickel. You pull out the calculator to figure out exactly how much that 10% is. And you don't give a dime over that. If that's you, ask God for a right heart. Because he loves a cheerful you. And it's critical that we learn how not to be hypocrites. Because again, we're the advertisement. And to move from being a hypocrite to being a genuine follower of Jesus. We have to not just follow the letter of the law. But we need to search for and follow the heart of the law as well. A second principle is that we have to major in mercy. As Jesus continues the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about how the law says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And that's the way of the world, isn't it? Revenge. Retribution. But Jesus teaches us in Matthew chapter 5, verses 39 through 44. Do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and to take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, Go with them too, Mark. Give to the one who asks you. And do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Hypocrites. They care about being right. Jesus cares about loving. You've probably seen Christians who care a whole lot about stating their opinions and proving that they are right. They love to quote the Bible, and oftentimes they don't like, and point out other people's sins and talk very loudly about their political opinions. And what's telling is that this Christian who is quoting scripture to prove that the Bible promotes life over abortion has never even thought of actually sitting down next to a pregnant teenager who feels that they have nowhere to turn and loving them. No. They just want to prove to everyone that they know the truth and that they are right. Hypocrites care about being right. But Jesus cares about being loving. Amen. So the question for you, what do you care about? you care more about being right or more about being loved.
A third principle to help us not to be hypocrites is to do our good deeds in secret. Jesus says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. And he gives an example to the needy, of you know, giving to the needy, or praying for someone. And this is challenging. Because we naturally want to keep our sins a secret. And we naturally would like our good deeds to be done in public. Right? We want to look good. But Jesus teaches this countercultural, counterintuitive lifestyle of revealing your sins and keeping your good deeds a secret. When you think about that, you realize just how attractive that really is. We live in a world where people make sure that you know the good things about them and make sure that you never find out about the bad things. So if you knew someone who were real, who were so authentic that they weren't afraid to let you see their flaws, and they never showed off, never bragged, you could tell from their character that they were good people, but they never made an outward show of those good people. Wouldn't you want to be around someone like that? Wouldn't you want to be more like them? That would be good advertisement. Those would be the kind of Christ followers who wouldn't turn people off from church. And those are the types of Christ followers that we want here at Pat. But if you've already been turned off by church, maybe you're here today, but church really hasn't been a priority for you. Well, first, I'd like to say to you again that God is for those who have been turned off by church. And maybe your experience with church has kind of led you to give up on God. But know that God has never and never will give up on you. And let me share some advice from the end of that Sermon on the Mount, found in Matthew chapter 7, 24 through 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose. And the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell with a great crash. Jesus ends with a story. And it's a story that begs the question, what will be your foundation? What is your faith really based on? Underneath it all, what is the foundation of your faith? If your faith depends on Jesus, well, he's the rock. He will never change. He will never falter. He will never let you down. And so your faith will stand strong. But if your faith is in a person, is in a church, well, that person or that church will probably let you down. When that happens, your faith will crumble. Much like that sand castle, when the waters hit it, put all the time in to make a beautiful sand castle, but eventually the tide will come in and it will crumble. It will fall with a great crash. 
Some of you have been there. Some of you might be there right now. And looking back, maybe you realize that the problem is that you put your faith in a person, or you put your faith in a pastor, or you put your faith in a church. And if that's you, can I encourage you to not give up on Jesus? If you went to a restaurant and you had a horrible experience, you might give up on that restaurant. It reminds me of a time Amy and I went to a Quiznos. This Quiznos was attached to a gas station, the first red flag. <laughs> Amy got really, really sick from that Quiznos. I'm not sure we've ever actually even been back to Quiznos. I know we've never been back to a restaurant attached to a gas station. We gave up on food because of a bad experience. But you wouldn't give up on all restaurants, and you wouldn't give up on food itself. And if you've had a bad experience with a Christian, it might be understandable that you gave up on that person, or even that church. But you can't give up on all Christians, and you certainly don't give up on Jesus. Amen. If you put your faith in Him, you'll see He'll never let you down. And I'd also say, don't give up on church. Again, there may be a church you've given up on, but don't give up on church altogether. I realize it may be easy to do, but it's just something you can't do. Because you need people in this journey of life. Paul Tournier once said, there are two things we cannot do alone. One is to be married, and the other is to be a Christian. If you read your Bible, you realize he's right. God never meant for a Christian to do faith alone. We need each other. And you need a church. Even if you've had bad experiences in the past. But it does make me wonder, why church? God must have realized that churches are filled with human beings. And the human beings, we are always screwing up. So no church, no church whatsoever, will ever be able to perfectly live out what he wanted. And some churches will, will fail miserably. So why church? I like what Philip Yancey once said in his book, Church, why bother? He writes about the time when a composer, Igor Stravinsky, wrote a new piece that contained a very difficult violin passage. After several weeks of rehearsal, the solo violinist came up to Stravinsky and said that he couldn't play it. He had given his best effort, but he found the passage too difficult. Perhaps even unplayable. Stravinsky replied, I understand that. What I'm after is the sound of someone trying to play. Yancey writes, perhaps something similar is what God had in mind for church. I remember hearing a similar illustration of a pastor named Earl Palmer. He was defending the church against critics. He would dismiss the church for its hypocrisy, its failures, its inability to live up to the New Testament standards. Palmer deliberately chose in his illustration a community that was known for its cultural unsophistication. He said when the Milpitas High School Orchestra attempts Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the result is appalling. I wouldn't be surprised if the performance made old Ludwig roll over in his grave, despite his deafness. 
You might ask, why bother? Why inflict on those poor kids the terrible burden of trying to render what the immortal Beethoven had in mind? Many professional orchestras can't even get it right. And the answer is, the, Mil the Milpitas High School Orchestra will give some people in that audience their only encounter with Beethoven's great night sympathy. Far from perfection, it is nevertheless the only way they will ever hear Beethoven's mes message. I remind myself of Earl Palmer's analogy. Whenever I start to squirm in a church service, although we may never achieve what the great composer had in mind, there's no other way for those sounds to be heard here on earth. So as a church, we're never going to be perfect. But we're the advertising. And the people in this community who've been turned off by church, they need us. And they need us with God's help. And they need us to give it our very best Heavenly Father, Lord, help us to be good advertising. When people see us, when people see our actions, when they see how we treat people, help them to see you. Help them to see the perfection that you live with, that we can only hope have a good run. Lord, guide us. Help us to not be hypocrites. Help us to be your servants. And no matter what we do, help us to be good advertisers. In your son's name. Amen.